I'm very pleased to be allowed to introduce uh, Alan Atkinson to you. Uh, he's been a major figure in the whole sustainability world for the last 20 or so years. Started as a journalist, brought out a journal on dealing with these issues. Uh, he's become a, an, a sustainability entrepreneur, I suppose we call it, uh, because he runs a major group that does sustainability training, consulting, and, and education. Uh, he's also written uh, bestsellers. He tells me that he has passed the magic 10,000 copy mark on his books, which I'm very envious about since there are not many people in the academic world who reach those sorts of heights. Um, his uh, earlier book was called Believing Cassandra, an optimist looks at a pessimist's world. And since I'm afraid I'm a Cassandra rather than, than an optimist, it's quite a privilege to be hopefully persuaded uh, that I should change my spots. Uh, his most recent book is called The IS, IS Agreement, How Sustainability Can Transform, transform Organizational Performance and Transform the World. Um, I hope we might be able to equally say save the world for that second uh, that second statement. Uh, the book is on sale. I believe that people have been buying it. Alan's willing at the end of the lecture to sit here and sign it for you if uh, you so desire. So with that, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Teddy. Uh, and it's a delight to be here at LSE. Uh, talking with you and to see old friends in the audience uh, and hopefully make some new ones. I just have to ask though, is anybody here because they saw our ad on Facebook? Uh, that was a complete waste of money. <laughs> you have to pay, do you? <laughs> um, so, uh, my honor and privilege uh, this evening is to give you a, a look, perhaps, at a different way of thinking about the challenges that we face that we call the sustainability challenges, uh, the challenges around climate change, around feeding the uh, billion people who are lacking food, around transforming the technologies of energy uh, and water that we're so dependent on. I, I'm going to be painting a picture that is positive, but I, I have to make a couple of qualifiers first that if you're expecting well, oh, here's, here's the title of my talk first. Um, optimism, pessimism, and the, not the end, but the sustainability transformation of the world. And if you're expecting a talk about how to overcome pessimism, if you're expecting me to somehow convince Teddy uh, to, to, to abandon his, his worries about the, the traje trajectory of the world and the structures that are heading us in the wrong direction, you may be disappointed. If you're expecting me to give you a formula for optimism, a sort of don't worry, be happy, it'll all work out just fine sort of argument, I also am afraid you'll be disappointed because what I'm talking about tonight is change. I'm talking about change. I'm talking about processes of change because these are the origins of anything like hope or optimism. It's about the ability to, uh, to recognize, to analyze, to participate, to generate transformative processes of change in a variety of contexts, and that's what we'll be focusing on for most of this talk. I'm going to make the talk a bit personal to begin with, because I think that the issues that we're talking about are personal. You know, in the 1970s, you said the personal is the political, and the political is the personal. I would say that sustainability is personal, and our personal lives are all about sustainability as well, and that these things, they interact. So here's my, my baby picture, you know, because... Uh, I was born into a world that I certainly didn't create, where a lot of these patterns that we're talking about were already well underway in terms of the, their development. In 1960, not only did I, as a newborn infant, really not have a clue about the trajectory that the world was on relative to, say, climate change, but nobody else did either, with the exception of a few scientists. Uh, the measurement of carbon dioxide emissions uh, from Mauna Loa, uh, for example, had started only in 1957. Uh, now, <clears throat> that's ignoring the achievement of uh, one of my now countrymen, Svante Arrhenius, who did the calculations back in the late 1890s on carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuel use. Um, by the way, motivated, I, the legend has it, by the departure of his wife. He got very depressed, as Swedes sometimes do, and uh, locked himself in to study did pencil and paper calculations on carbon dioxide emissions for nine months. <coughs> 
making pencil and paper grids of the whole world and the development patterns within each little grid uh, to estimate what might happen on their own energy pathways, and came to the conclusion that the globe would be warmed up by all this fossil fuel combustion by about two to five degrees centigrade, depending on what happened, which is pretty much what the IPCC has been saying. He said 100 years ago, of course, the punchline is that he said, and isn't that nice? being from Sweden and thinking about nice warmer summers and, and increased agricultural production. So that was the state of our knowledge in 1960. Fast forward, 1978, uh, and I'm a college student like some of you. I'm in a course looking, one of the earlier courses on uh, population resources and economics uh, at uh, my then university, Tulane in New Orleans, and I read this book, The Limits to Growth, which had come out some years earlier. 1972, The Limits to Growth was published, to enormous international, well, I won't say international acclaim, but international, or fanfare even, but international noise. Uh, the book was uh, certainly celebrated by a lot of people. There were massive um, seminars put on in Washington, D.C. and in Europe. Uh, and in fact, the history of this book is part of the first chapter of, of my book, Believe in Cassandra, uh, which I'll tell you about more in a minute. Uh, but the book was also really intensively attacked, uh, and attacked not just because of its scientific assumptions or the modeling techniques that were used by the MIT computer scientists, but it was attacked because it was burrowing into one of the core assumptions of society, that growth was not only infinitely possible, but inevitable. Uh, and, and this led to uh, really vicious uh, academic uh, attacks on the authors, Danella Meadows, um, among them. Danella, known as Dana Meadows, who died in 2001, uh, was the lead author of this report, which uh, was built on computer models that were generated by her then husband, and she was part of that team, and a larger group of, of people whose average age, by the way, was just 26. Just 26. And they generated these computer models of global population and resource uh, and waste uh, that uh, seemed to show to them that we were heading in the wrong direction, or heading towards a brick wall, I should say, anyway. They made a fairly sanguine prediction that sometime in the next 100 years, this continued increase in our resource consumption and waste would have to come to some kind of an end, uh, and, that would, and that a transformative change in the way we managed our economies was necessary. So that doesn't sound so radical, if I say it that way today, but it attracted enormous attention, and of course they were um, ridiculed. One of the words of ridicule that was used to criticize these, these early uh, scientists who were trying to wake us up to the, the limits that we face as a, as a planet, they were called Cassandras. And you can still see this word used today in that way, that, oh, that's just a, a, a Teddy said it himself, a Cassandra, um, a pessimist, a doomsayer. Now, the remarkable thing about this epithet is that Cassandra, the prophet in old Greek Troy, had the had the enormous uh, good misfortune of having been blessed by Apollo with the gift of prophecy. She could see the future. But Apollo also cursed her so that nobody would believe anything that she said. So to have been criticized by the um, critics of the day as being in a Cassandra was enormously ironic since Cassandra was always right. <laughs> and in fact, even the Wall Street Journal in 2008 in a cover story finally uh, you might say, I took this as a kind of an indicator that, that, that things had changed, ran a cover story saying, well, basically the argumentation in the limits to growth probably needs to be seen as essentially correct. Now, they sort of hemmed and hawed around that, at least in this cover story, but they did come to that, um, to that conclusion. Um, I, uh, through a complicated series of, uh, series of um, career moves, ended up editing a journal on sustainability, one of the first of its kind, I guess, at least in the U.S. context. And one of the contributing editors was Dana Meadows. Uh, so she became a friend, a mentor, a colleague, uh, and uh, she asked me to do a book that would somehow translate the arguments and the limits to growth to a, more, to a broader audience. Uh, so I did that book. Uh, it took a long time to get it. i get a little, little of the backstory behind Believing Cassandra. This was the lovely Australian edition of the book that was produced. Now I'm going to show you the difference between Australian, which is more like British marketing, and American marketing. This was the original American cover of Believing <laughs> Cassandra. I don't know if you noticed the difference there. I'll take that. It's just, just see if you see. <clears throat> so, 
um, which is one of the many reasons I am so delighted to be working with Erskan. Uh, I tried, I have to say, this book went through a lot of bad drafts. I mean, really bad drafts. Uh, this was the uh, cover of the actual first outline that I submitted to my publishers in the U.S. for this book back in 1999. Saving the World in Your Spare Time, How to Restore Nature, Prevent Economic Calamity, and Rescue Civilization from Chaos and Collapse in just minutes a day. Um, you know, I was trying to be a little funny, but I didn't realize just how funny I was being. And uh, fortunately, this, um, I got some, some very good advice uh, about how to reapproach the book and, and how to put a personal voice into it and how to, to begin to think about what's involved in, in making change. Uh, and part of that notion of, of, of and why I started off this lecture also by making it kind of a personal story uh, was to help readers and help all of us begin to identify with what's happening. But it's not just a series of abstract events that's occurring out in the world. It's something that's happening to us, to people we know, increasingly in this Facebook world, people we really actually know, you know. I mean, I've got f Facebook friends who are sitting in Egypt or Kenya uh, and whose daily lives are affected by the things that we write and study about if we're teaching development studies. I'm sure Teddy does as well. Um, so. I also got the advice to draw on the, 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 the wealth of intellectual capital in my network of friends. Uh, this is a group called the Balaton Group, which you may never have heard of. It's a network of researchers and practitioners who have been working on sustainability and systems for a long time. Founded by Danilla and Dennis Meadows, authors of Limits to Growth, uh, meeting for 30 years, uh, once a year on the shore of Lake Balaton in Hungary, where a lot of sort of uh, innovative thinking occurred about Things that are now standard practice in sustainability, often many, many things began, began as informal conversations in a network of people. So again, this notion that to make it personal, that it's about us as individuals and then us as people working in groups to relate to these changes and to begin working on them together. The Balaton Group continues. I have the uh, privilege now of serving as its co-president. Uh, and every year we meet and every year we get re-inspired by each other and think about new th stuff, new ways to go out and try to change the world. Uh, and fortunately, uh, we as a group are not as lonely as we used to be. Uh, now, there are lots of groups like this that meet and support each other and think about it. Um, I like to say that I, I wrote Believe in Cassandra partly just driven out of a desire to feel a little less lonely in the kind of work that I did. Because you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago when I first read the book, I, I probably, I literally felt like one of a handful of people in my entire graduating university class who not only, not only understood what might be happening to the planet, but cared more to the point. So I was hoping to find more people that cared. That was really a major, uh, a major uh, motivator. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to write something that was fun to read. This was the guy that actually edited the book for me. He didn't edit it in a line-by-line -line fashion at all. He just took me out for coffee a couple of times. Jim Schley is a wonderful poet. Uh, find his work on the web. Um, and if it weren't for Jim, that book would be still saving the world in your spare time just minutes a day. So I just want to acknowledge Jim. Um, and this is the lovely new cover. Thank you very much, Earthscan, for this lovely new cover uh, of Believing Cassandra, which is basically trying to help us address the questions of how we got into this mess, help people understand it. Why didn't we listen to the Cassandras the first time around? Whose fault is this anyway? Who's to blame? And where does this word sustainability come from? Does it mean anything? Is it just a buzzword? Is there any kind of action or reality attached to it? Uh, well, <clears throat> you know, the, at the bottom, one of the things I'm, I found myself, and I hope I can, I can guess that you find yourself confronting, is that there are some core attitudes in human behavior that are very difficult to kind of get around. And one of them is encapsulated by this quote from Hunter Thompson, faster, faster, until the thrill of speed overcomes the fear of death. Uh, and, and it leads to a story that's told in, in, in some of the, one of the opening chapters of Believe in Cassandra, which I thought I'd share with you. It, 1982, I was living in Malaysia, working as a therapist for heroin addicts, believe it or not, on a, on a prestigious fellowship. I won a fellowship and found myself living in a camp with a bunch of junkies acting as their therapist. And I really wondered whether or not this was exactly what I signed up for. But I learned a lot that year, a lot of things. But one of the things I learned about was not to get on a bus like this. <clears throat> this was a, a kind of an extra bus added to the holiday traffic going from Kuala Lumpur back to Ipoh. 
Uh, and in those days, Malaysia did not have the fine highway systems that it had. It had very good drivers. In fact, it had the lowest accident rate in Southeast Asia, but it had the highest fatal accident rate in Southeast Asia because people would pass constantly on these two-lane roads. So I got on this bus, and it was nighttime, the end of a long weekend. We're traveling through the jungles and palm, uh, palm oil plantations of Malaysia between KL and Ipoh, and, uh, uh, and, and the headlights go out on the bus. And the driver comes to a stop, and he does something I've never seen a bus driver do in my life since. He turned to the passengers, the full bus full of people, and said, what should I do? <laughs> and the passengers said uh, in Malay, jalan, jalan, it means go on, go on. So he gets back on the road, and he's driving at 30 or 40 kilometers per hour, steering by the light of the oncoming headlights which, by the way, are full of cars that occasionally are passing other cars in re really rapid fashion. So they would come out, they would suddenly see the glint of a huge bus you know, coming, and then dip back into the lane. And you know, I'm just sitting here holding onto the seat going, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? I'm a little excited, though, I confess. <laughs> this is one of those cultural experiences I signed up to have. You know? <clears throat> so, so, um, so we go on for another 15 kilometers or so. And the rain starts, and I just, I mean the Malaysian rain starts, the, you know, the dumping rain starts. And, and, um, and that makes it a little bit harder for him to steer, but you can still see the headlights coming through the windshield until the windshield wipers stop. So he stops the bus again. He once again asks the passengers what he should do. And the passengers, at this point, I'm looking around and everybody's got this kind of like, ecstatic, wide-eyed look on their faces, and they all go, Jalam, Jalam! <laughs> and he gets back on the road. And now he's, now, now the, the water is pouring in cascades down the front windshield of this bus, which, and, and there's a glint of light coming through this kind of warped, un, like, like you're driving through the ocean or something. And he's going at five or 10 kilometers per hour, and, and, and it gets deathly silent. It just gets deathly silent. Everybody's like this, and then they're like this, and then they're like this, and we all think we're going to die. And there were multiple religions in that bus. We were all praying to different gods um, and practicing different traditions, hoping that we were going to survive. Now, we did, obviously. I'm standing here before you. We survived. You know, no matter how dark it looked, and it looked really dark at a certain moment, we survived, and we went on. You know? And that story became emblematic for me of a lot of things about how people work how we tend to say jalan jalan in the midst of the most risky situations. There's a wonderful book called Sway. Um, I forget the author's name. You'll have to Google it up. Sway, published in 2008, looking at how even the most careful people, when faced with a certain set of circumstances, can get taken by this kind of feeling that they want to continue doing the dangerous thing that they shouldn't be doing and end up often not escaping the catastrophe that I escaped. And of course, I often also think about things like that well-known invisible hand in the market economy. And just, you know, whose hands are on the bus that we're all driving on, basically. So that story is one of a number of stories that I use in the book to try to make what we're talking about. This abstract notion of runaway growth hitting, oh, by the way, you're not supposed to see that yet. Um, <laughs> Um, runaway go growth, uh, heading towards the physical limits of the planet and social limits of the planet, easier to comprehend. So here comes my favorite sentence in the whole book, Believe in Cassandra. It's this one, because if you're an author and you get to write that sentence and you're not writing pornographic novels, then you know, you know you're onto something. Because what I was trying to do was to make the issue of population growth a bit more real for all of us. Because when you take a look at a population growth curve, what you're looking at is an awful lot of people who had sex. Yeah? Some of it happy and some of it not, by the way. Some of it very unhappy sex for the women involved, but that's another story. But in any case, it's all about sex, if you look at it the right way. Uh, the third chapter of the book is called In the Gallery of Global Trends. And so I show you a whole bunch of, of graphs and invite you to a more creative kind of interpretation of what's actually happening here. You know? What's actually happening here is that people really want children. What's, really hap what's happening here is people really want pleasure. It turns out that there's an iPhone app. Did you read this article? A uh, study on happiness globally. And people with iPhones download a little app, and then the researchers would call them at random times and ask them what they were doing, and then ask them how happy they were on a scale. 
So now we have a globally published study that says that people are happiest when they're having sex. Now we know that. It's been established scientifically. Um, at least, well, at least among iPhone users. Yeah? So what, what this means is when we, when we talk blithely about population issues, we often separate it from these deep human longings that are at the root of these issues. And not just sex, but you know, what about shopping? You know? Uh, as a deep human longing, which apparently people have, since uh, it's, you know, it's not state-controlled economic planning that's producing lots of shopping malls around the world. You know? There is something in the human that enjoys the experience of the diversity and acquisitiveness and variety and intermingling that occur in a market of any kind. And shopping malls are just the modern markets. It's been that case for all of you know, understood human history. Um, but they all have a backside. You know, they all have a backside, and this, the particular backside of shopping includes the garbage in Cairo or the traffic jams in Jakarta where the cars are coming into the city at such a, a rate, the sales is coming at such a rate that they're literally predicting that the city's traffic system will turn into a parking lot, that it'll be impossible to move in just a few years' time. Yeah. Now, of course, they also predicted that there would be, you know, nothing but horse shit in the streets of, of London, and that didn't happen, so something will happen. But in any case, this is the situation in Jakarta today. Or that picture above I took myself and it's flying through the uh, Asian brown cloud, that permanent layer of particulates that is uh, sitting on top of, of, of everywhere from, uh, from Pakistan about to the Philippines and reducing the solar energy coming down to the earth by 10 to 30 percent. And in fact, that particulate cloud, which is not just over Asia, but is particularly visible there, at least if you're in an airplane, uh, is partly responsible for saving us from about a degree of global warming. So here's the ironic situation that we're in because of our love for shopping and other kinds of consumption. If we were to actually clean up our air, we would be in more trouble than we're currently in. We have to keep doing what we're doing even though what we're doing is bad for what we want to stop doing. Do you follow me? We're in a kind of a Chinese you know, finger puzzle. Uh, so it's, it's even more complicated or worse than you thought. <laughs> If you didn't know about global dimming, then read, read about global dimming and you'll say, oh my goodness, you know, this is even more reason to be pessimistic. Consider the internet, which you know, I use every day, I'm sure you do too. It's fantastic. Look at this happy couple looking at their shiny new laptop. You know? And the, the backside of that is, of course, this is the titanium mine effluent in, a, in the, one of the regions of China where titanium mining is occurring. So these are all good news, bad news stories for, for all of them. We get pleasure, we get, we're, we're really drawn to these things. They're not small matters that we are so drawn to them. Take light, for example, uh, which is one of the, producing light and heat is, of course, one of the core things that we burn stuff to produce. And if you live in Africa or you live in the Himalayas and you don't have electricity in your village, the coming of electricity is often equated to, to the coming of the sun. I mean, you're, you, you know, suddenly your children can do homework, you know, your whole rhythm of life changes, you have access to technologies you wouldn't have had before. So this is not something we want to say that you know, the world shouldn't be allowed to have because we need to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Yeah? It's, a it's, a, it's interesting. Here, here by the way, uh, if you've heard the phrase peak oil, this is the first acknowledgement in print by the International Energy Agency that peak oil is a reality. Uh, it's the most recent report just released in the last couple of weeks, and you can see it, you know. I mean, this is, this is current crude oil that we know about. This is the oil that we know exists but haven't actually started harvesting yet. And this is the stuff that we expect we might find. So even if, even if we are as optimistic as this new policy's optimistic scenario is, then we, we have reached peak oil. Oil's at a flat. Yeah? Oil's at a flat. All right, so... As I said, we're not in the realm of optimism yet. We're still in the realm of describing just what the situation is. And the situation has to be understood not just in terms of what's happening in an issue-by-issue -issue basis, but what's happening in pattern terms. So as I put these graphs up on the screen, which come from the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, please just notice the shape of all of these curves, the shape of these curves, which all of them show that classic hockey stick sort of shape that we've learned about uh, from watching uh, movies about climate change. This is called exponential growth. 
and it's the, pheno it's the phenomenon of our time. It is the signature phenomenon of our time. I actually have a song about exponential growth, but I wouldn't dare to sing it at LSE. You'll have to go on YouTube and Google me up to find me singing the song about exponential growth. For you, what I want to say is that if this is not a familiar phenomenon to you, it's worth understanding because it, it is both the, the real uh, essence of the problem that we're facing when it comes to the sustainability issues that we're talking about, and it is also the source of understanding why there's any reason for optimism in the world, as you'll see as we get a little farther into this. All of these graphs could be interpreted as good news or bad news depending on your perspective. Yeah? The growth in paper consumption, for example, really incredibly fast. Now, if you are somebody who's worried about deforestation, that is bad news. If you're somebody who's worried about literacy for girls in Egypt, that is good news. Yeah? More, there's more access to books. The, everything has a positive and a negative aspect, which is, which is why in talking about these issues, we have to try and, uh, I believe anyway, uh, under, understand why we're being uh, drawn and driven to do the things we're doing rather than just kind of demonizing some sort of force out there that's pushing us in the wrong direction. The result comes here. Uh, how many of you have seen this study from Nature on planetary boundaries? If you haven't had a lecture about that at LSE, I strongly encourage you to invite someone here to talk about this paper. Uh, it was um, produced by an international team of scientists who, who took on the task of thinking about where we were in relation to the limits uh, of the planet on water, on climate, and everything else. And, and, and by the way, I'll just add a footnote. I mentioned this group, the Balaton group, earlier. Um, you know, in uh, around 2007, we hosted a little dialogue with uh, people, people at that meeting about whether or not you could do such an index of how far over the limits we were, whether the science was sound enough to do it yet. And one of the participants in that dialogue went back to Stockholm and started a, another sort of think tank set of, dis of discussions. And to make a long story short, it ended up being this paper. So, you know, sometimes just hosting a little dialogue of people can be the generating idea for something that becomes at least for me, quite important, which was this paper, which helps us understand where we're over the line already, and we're over the line already in areas like the nitrogen cycle, uh, phosphorus and, and nitrogen, the nutrient cycle on our planet, um, biodiversity loss, and on climate change. And we're approaching this green line, which is the safety zone, and several other you know, key systems. The paper's online in nature. You can, you can find it and read it. You don't have to pay to get to it. If you're in LSE, you can always find it. This is maybe one of the most important papers on the global situation that I've seen published in the last 10 years. Yeah? So I strongly recommend it. That's, that's, the, that's the nature of the problem. And you're responsible. It's your fault. No. <laughs> One of the things that is a key message of believing Cassandra is that it's not about individuals. It's about systems. <clears throat> it's about systems. It's about the systems that have been patiently built by the generations previous to us in order to increase our developmental quality of life. Yeah? And then those systems have a momentum all their own that is impersonal. It's not a personal matter. It's an impersonal matter uh, in terms of what's actually driving the change. It becomes a personal matter when we're thinking about how to make the change. But if you're, if you're, if, even if all you do is read chapter four, that will help release you from some of the emotional <laughs> guilt that sometimes attaches to people who are trying to wrestle with these, with these issues. Uh, it's all about making change. And so I introduce in these books a model for understanding cultural change. Uh, the model is called amoeba, after the biology of an amoeba, which you remember, may remember from your biology classes. You know, the way an amoeba eats, it sticks out a, a little protoplasmic pseudopod and grabs a poor little paramecium. By the way, the, the, the amoebas are like the tigers of the micro world. If you're a little paramecium, you're deathly afraid of amoeba because they're, they're out to get you. Uh, and they, they grab this new little paramecium and then they, they, they swarm up around it and engulf it. Yeah? And this is very much like what culture does. Culture is about new ideas and, 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 and it's the process of, in, of, of absorbing new ideas that I'm desperately interested in because sustainable development is all about new ideas. Uh, 
And in this model, there's a lot of fun stuff, which I, which I, I, I we run simulation games around this, uh, with reactionaries who are resistant to the changes, and curmudgeons who have been trying to make change for a long time, but they gave up, and they try to tell you to give up too, because there's no point in trying to make change, because, you know, I've been there before, and then nobody listened to me, and human beings aren't worth it anyway, and, you know, uh, I'm just leaving you alone in my, in my cabin with my shotgun, thank you very much. You know, that's sort of curmudgeonly, and you may have encountered people like that in, in a cubicle next to you. Um, uh, so understanding these social roles in change becomes quite crucial, again, to having any kind of sense of hope and optimism about making change. Um, <clears throat> change agents are the people that help us to take ideas that are marginal, that are new, that are generated by the uh, research community, by the wild-eyed visionaries of our times, and turn them into a message that other people can understand. Al Gore is a particularly good example of being an excellent change agent, of having listened to Roger Revelle and other scientists and translated that into a variety of really interesting books. Uh, one of the things that when I, when I revised Believing Cassandra for a new decade, I had to dramatically revise my story about Al Gore, which occupies a big section of chapter two. Uh, because in the original version, it was 99 when I wrote that book first. And Al Gore had written his book, Earth and the Balance, and published it in 92. It was an enormously sh shining example of great journalism on what global problems were like back in those days. And then immediately after becoming vice president under Clinton, his sort of environmental stock declined year by year to the point where by the time I published Believe in Cassandra at the end of the Clinton presidency, Al Gore was actually the target of protests by environmental groups for decisions that he had supposedly championed in his time as vice president, you know, which is fortunately forgotten now. Uh, but at the time I, I published the first version, Al Gore was not the saint uh, for climate change that we think of him today. Um, he became that again once he had the good fortune or misfortune of losing the election in, uh, in the year 2000. Uh, and, and it was a fun moment to be able to say, because in, in the first version of Believe in Cassandra, I said, think what would happen if Al Gore hadn't been elected vice president? Wouldn't he, couldn't he have become like the Rachel Carson of his generation? And I said, the world will never know whether he could have been that. And now we do know he did become the Rachel Carson of his generation, or one of them, and a very powerful agent of change. Um, like this guy, Bill McKibben, uh, somebody again who started off as a writer and uh, published that fantastic book, uh, The End of Nature, very pessimistic book, uh, back in the at the end of the 1980s, and published a series of searching environmental books of, of, of that kind, and then realized that he had to do something. And he got much more active in translating the findings of science around that number, 350, that we needed to learn uh, ways of dialing ourselves back to 350 ppm. And by the way, if you haven't been tracking what's happening with 350.org, I really recommend it. Right now they're doing a global art an art project that involves thousands and thousands of people creating exhibits that can only be seen by satellites from space. So they make this, these huge things, and then the satellites take pictures and they publish them on the web uh, as part of their actions around uh, raising awareness on Cancun. Or uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, also a fantastic change agent who maintains that, that sense of what, what, uh, what is necessary despite you know, any odds, you know. And, and there was a fantastic quote in The Economist about her. Um, which said that, you know, that she, she maintained her optimism despite the fact that it's on the flimsiest of foundations. You know? And now I'd like to talk about that. You know, what does it mean to have flimsy foundations? Uh -huh, this is cutting off part of, the, part of it. Um, first, first, let's review, and then we're coming to the conclusion here. Let's review why one could easily decide that there really is no hope for us here on planet Earth. And if you're familiar with uh, these American talk shows like you know, David Letterman and uh, you know, the top 10 lists, um, I'm gonna take this top 10, top 10 reasons to believe that we're done for, and I'm gonna take it in backwards order, yeah? So reason number 10 is just the obvious one, that humans are resistant to change, and we're resistant to change until it's too late. You know, look what happened to New Orleans. I worked in New Orleans as a consultant for several years, and, and they had just begun to realize that they really needed to take action on these things, and it was too late. They had been resistant to change up until that point. Number nine, runaway feedback loops create catastrophic climate change. That's a popular one. Uh, that uh, the release of methane, for example, and other kinds of feedback effects will just trick some thresholds, and we'll just, we're just, it's just beyond repair at that point, so we might as well give up. Eight. 
peak everything. I showed you peak oil, but I haven't even said a word about peak phosphorus, which I just saw a presentation on by a researcher in Sweden called Harald Sverdrup that uh, basically tells me we've got 80 to 90 years of phosphorus left, and then basically starvation begins because phosphorus is a really irreplaceable element. In fact, just yes, two, two or three days ago in Stockholm, in the second page of the paper was an editorial cartoon showing an astronaut on the moon uh, with a shopping cart because, you know, we're going to be shopping for resources out in space eventually. And he was getting a message back from home base. They're saying, oh, yeah, while you're there, um, could you pick up a little extra phosphorus? <laughs> yeah, so, so we may be pushed to desperate measures on, on, on phosphorus along with, along with lots of other stuff that we really need. St uh, stupid, greedy, immoral people. This is kind of a base philosophy that many people have, that there just are a lot of stupid, greedy, immoral people that are corrupting all the systems that we have, and there's no chance we could possibly ever get around them. Um, I, number six used to be called stupid, greedy, and moral people, moral people two. Uh, number two, bad economists, but now I just said bad economics. Um, because uh, there is a lot of bad economics. The discount rate, for example. Uh, I'm sure that those of you studying at LSC have learned a lot about the discount rate. And I wonder if you've ever asked yourself why the discount rate is never, never has a, a change in sign. I mean, if you were, for example, uh, harvesting the 10 meter long sea cows that still existed in the Bering Sea back in the 1700s. When you got down to the last 100 sea cows, probably the value of those sea cows would have started going up rather than being discounted in the future. You know, the discount rate never goes up. It only brings the value down, to just pick one example. I brought this up with a leading uh, economist who advises the European Commission. And he said, well, your logic's right on that, but you know, you just haven't really got it. You know, you know, <laughs> The, 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 thing, the thing is, I mean, take, an, take a species, he said. If a species goes extinct, well, then eventually the technology will emerge that we can recreate that species as long as there's enough demand. You know, we can just, it's, it's everything substitutable, he said. Everything substitutable. So that's what I call bad economics. And bad economics absolutely could drive us, you know, down the, the, the road to destruction. I know that LSE doesn't teach bad economics anymore. You've gone through a transformative change in the institution, thanks to the presence of Nick Stern and others, and Teddy, of course. There's sway, which I mentioned already, or the human tendency to, tendency to fall for wishful thinking and to just um, imagine that the bus is going to survive whatever you do because you turn yourselves over to fate. Um, it turns out that you know, the top pilot in KLM, who was the chair of their safety committee, uh, made an enormous number of really bad decisions based on sway, based on his desire to make it on time, based on his desire to get out before a certain deadline, and caused the worst aviation crash in history at that point in, the, in, in, uh, in Tenerife. Now, read sway. It's, it'll really help you understand how humans really work. Well, for the water, food, energy, financial collapse, um, it'll all happen at once, it'll all happen big, and, and then we'll all be scrabbling around for, for, uh, uh, for the leftovers. Um, three, resource wars go through thermonuclear. We're, getting, we're raising the... Uh, Reason the ante here on what could possibly go wrong. For, uh, two, self-fulfilling prophecies of the apocalypse. That's where you, know, you have you know, splinter religious groups or, or other kinds of groups who just decide to bring it on uh, by accelerating things like the Unabomber tried to do in the American context, you may recall, with his letter bombs. And I think if the Unabomber had access to a thermonuclear device, for example, um, that might have been interesting. And the last reason, the number one reason why we may not make it is because life is good. Life is really good, because those of us who live in the parts of the world that need to change most have a really comfortable life. And that makes it very, very difficult to change. So we could probably stop there and go have beer and commiserate about the fate of the world. But I do have, of course, the top 10 list of reasons why we will make it. Uh, and uh, I'm going to spend a little time on, on each of them. I'll first go through the whole list. One is the, number 10 is the human brain. Nine, the power, powerful effect of getting the prices right. Eight, the rise of the green economy. Seven, harnessing exponential growth to new technology. Six, corporate leadership. Five, fantastic NGOs. Four, China. Three, unexpected runaway virtual cycles, virtuous cycles. Two, the big impact of the small fraction of people who are idealistically and ethically driven. And the number one reason why I think we'll make it is because we have no choice. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. On number 10, the human brain or the human brains, what I mean is that our brains are like, well, they're not like computers. Computers are more like brains. But when we hook them up, we actually produce really interesting results, and we produce them fast. This is a group work and one of the workshops that my firm does. This is Adelaide in South Australia. Uh, this is a group of senior officials who run the city and the state government. And, and they have worked through a process of 
of thinking about the trends in that city, the, the inter interactions and the, and the system that they have to worry about, the relationships between health, climate change, city planning, and they've produced some really amazing insights like, oh, we are subsidizing parking. People park for free. So all the money, so, so, that, so we're paying for them to get in their individual cars and drive to work, which is why they only had a 2% biking rate for all the state and city employees in that city, despite the fact that it was perfect for biking, perfect weather, flat, you know, wonderful for biking. So they did a small thing. They took the money that was in the budget that was going to spend, they were, they were, they were spending on, on parking, and they removed that subsidy. People started paying for parking. They took the money and they began subsidizing the purchase of bicycles for the employees. Now, they didn't stop there. They didn't say, okay, now we're going to buy you a bicycle, save the planet. They said, now we're going to help you buy a bicycle, and by the way, on Thursday night, it's singles night on the bicycles. We're all going to get together in our sexiest biking clothes and ride around and have beer afterwards. Oh, and by the way, those of you who are worried about that effect of putting a helmet on your hair, we're going to have a special little seminar at 5 o'clock on Wednesday to tell you, tell you how to deal with helmet hair. I'm not making this up. They really did all this stuff. And, and within eight months, the rate of biking in Adelaide among the 100,000 employees of the city and state went from 2% to 30% in just eight months. That's because of just smart thinking, hooking up the brains. By the way, we just discovered, as I told a group of students earlier, um, new, newly published research, you can, you can measure the intelligence of a group. And the way that you can know the intelligence of a group is not how smart the smartest person in the group is. It turns out the key is how well they talk to each other, how much they share time talking and listening. That's the key predictive element as to how well and intelligently a group performs functions together which suggests that maybe we have a lot more capacity to work together than we understand, and that we might want to learn a lot more about how to do that. Number nine, the powerful effect of getting the prices right. Um, I did a study together with my colleagues at the, uh, uh, with colleagues of the United Nations uh, Department of Economic and Social Affairs Division of Sustainable Development based on their World Economic and Social Survey, where we took a look at what, um, what would happen if we invested at the scale people are saying we could and should invest in renewable energy and other kinds of low emission technologies around the world. What would happen to the world economy? What you see here is that in every single part of the world, uh, the, the red line is business as usual. The blue line is what happens with a massive investment in uh, renewable energy and other things. And this is per capita income. In every part of the world, per capita income far outperforms the business as usual scenario if you do this massive investment in renewable energy. We called it the big push strategy, that if you pumped a tremendous upfront uh, investment into renewable energy around the world, you would push uh, the price of solar and wind and other kinds of technologies down a lot faster so that they began to spread much faster, which is exactly what the US government did with computer chips back in the 60s and 70s. It's exactly what they did. Pumped a lot of money into the system up front to, to essentially uh, force the rate of innovation to a higher level uh, and the diffusion of that, of that market. So we've done this before, actually, at large scale um, to rapidly uh, increase things. So you get the prices right by putting the subsidies in the right places. Change happens really fast. Number eight, the rise of the green economy. I don't know if you're aware of this, but a lot of countries are already experimenting with this. South Korea, in response to the financial crisis, uh, spent uh, pretty much 80 to 85 percent of its stimulus package, enormous stimulus package, on green stuff. Not only that, but they created uh, accountability mechanisms. Every department of government in South Korea has a chief of green stuff. And that chief of green stuff reports to a presidential committee. Uh, they're, they're pumping billions of dollars into green technologies, a family of green technologies. Uh, and they're doing this not because they think they want to be green, but because they expect they're going to get a tremendous return on that investment, that a 2% outlay of GDP will produce a 4% increase in GDP. So this is happening, that Indonesia has just made this commitment. I'm working with uh, a similar program in Egypt right now where we're trying to position a similar kind of step forward. So the rise of the green economy is something to pay very close attention to. Uh, and I know, that, I know that there's a new report coming out on green, econ green economics by Jonathan Port, or has come out. But, so that's being talked about here too. Green is becoming competitive. My client in Egypt is the Egyptian Council on Com National Council on Competitiveness. Not the Council on Climate Change, not the Council on Sustainable Development. It's the Council on Competitiveness for the Egyptian economy, yeah? looking at 
basically, what, to, what are the strategies we need to do to accelerate the transition to a renewable economy? Seven, harnessing the exponential growth of new technology. And that's just paying attention to what's happening. What's happening is that we are on exponential growth patterns for all these new technologies. And when I was doing that work for the UN last year, I was also taking a look at, for example, Chinese planning around, you know, Chinese, China's become the dominant player in the market now in solar and wind. And, and it was quite remarkable. They had set goals for what the price per kilowatt hour of solar and wind energy should be, by what date, in order to make it affordable to people in certain economic brackets. And every year they had to advance that goal by a decade because they were outperforming their own, you know, their own expectations. The, the learning curves on, on renewable energy technology that most of the world was using had been drawn in 1992, I discovered, and hadn't been updated since. Yeah? The whole shape of the learning curve was wrong. Yeah? So something is really happening here, and we can harness that much more, than, more effectively than we're doing now. Uh, six, corporate leadership. I, uh, I work some with corporations, um, pretty big ones, and I can tell you that some of the stuff I've seen come out of, coming out of corporates is ahead of not just governments, as Paul Hawkins says here. Paul Hawkins is usually really critical of what corporations are doing. Now says that the corporations are ahead, some of them, of what the governments are willing to do on sustainability. And they're finding that they're bumping up against limits placed on them by governance rather than government trying to get corporations to change faster. In fact, I would say that some of these corporations are outperforming NGOs in terms of their ambition level. They're, they're proposing that they should become restorative enterprises, for example. Uh, and and I, there, there are some big NGOs I could mention which don't actually have that goal set in their own operations, for example. So something's really happening in, corporate, uh, in, in, in the corporate world. And I, I fortunately get to see that up close, and I can tell you that it's real. That there are, not that the CEOs of all companies believe in this stuff and are trying to, no. What I mean is that there's a serious process of transformative change happening. Usually people like you, maybe, who are working in those companies who, have, who are change agents and have found effective ways of bringing those ideas to management in powerful and convincing ways. That's what's happening. Five, fantastic NGOs. I mean, don't, I, I don't want to pretend like it's all about the corporate change. No, the NGOs have been paving the way, and some of them are doing really extraordinary stuff, most of it unsung. Uh, one, of the, one of them is called, I just decided to profile one called the Earth Charter, which is not as well known as it needs to be in the UK. It should be much better known. Uh, it should be better known in many countries, but it is well known in countries like Mexico and Brazil and the, and the Netherlands. Uh, you know, in, in, in Mexico, for example, most states have formally adopted it. Uh, the president, together with ministers, signed formal de declarations endorsing this statement of principles for a sustainable future, planting a billion trees, I think it was, or a hundred million, a lot of trees, a whole bunch of trees, um, and, and taking lots of other actions that, that probably you didn't, you've not heard about. But this is all happening in a major way around the world. For China, James Hansen, just the other day in journalistic terms, published, this, published an article where he said China is the best hope we have right now on these issues. China now leads the world in clean energy investments, et cetera, et cetera. He said it's the rest of the world that's got to catch up with China, that's got to learn from China. Yeah. So China, because of what that economy means to the world and by this, by, because of its scale and because of uh, the speed with which it is transforming and can, and can transform, is something that we need to be looking at more carefully. Three, unexpected runaway virtuous cycles. Meaning that once change starts, it happens faster than we expect. This is the RLC. You may know the story of the disappearance of the RLC, one of the great sort of sad stories of mismanagement of natural resources uh, from uh, the 20th century. But what you may not know is what's happened to the northern quarter of it when they began to try to repair the damage and refill that, that, that part of the sea. The, the, the planners thought that by, with a lot of investment and a lot of work, they might refill the sea to three meters, which is enough for fish and other industrial activity, within five to 10 years. In actual fact, it took only seven months to reach the, th to reach the three meter level because a lot of system effects kicked in that nobody could have predicted. We don't understand systems very well. They unravel faster than we understand, but they also re-ravel faster than we understand. And this is something we can also almost bank on, I would say. Two, the big impact of the small fraction of people who are idealistic and ethically driven. I, I was saying to this group of, of, of students and colleagues earlier that, you know, if you're waiting for the entire world to wake up and have an epiphany experience and start working on sustainability, then you'll wait an awful long time. But, but if you work on the people who do care 
and try to essentially help them and multiply them, then they can be very powerful agents of change. This is Junko Edahiro, a good friend of mine who started her career as a translator. In fact, her story is a remarkable one. She couldn't speak more than a few words of English when she went to the U.S. for a couple of years with her husband, decided to teach herself to be a simultaneous, simultaneous translator for two years, accomplished that goal, and then practiced her craft by translating for people like Lester Brown and Al Gore. So then she became an expert on sustainability and climate change and environment, and now she was recently the sole woman and sole NGO representative on the President's Advisory Council on Climate Change. Not only that, but she's really clever. She gets the Ministry of Environment guys, they're mostly guys, and, and the Ministry of Financial Affairs guys to show up at these biking events. So they bike together in Tokyo. No, they run together. I'm sorry, I'm getting the biking and the running mixed up. They run together, they do like a half marathon together, and then they go, you know, drink sake. And they're getting to know each other <laughs> and building relationship. She's a change agent. She's a remarkable person. Um, Remarkable people are also right around you, like my friend Michael Lund, who's sitting right in the middle of this theater. Michael, uh, in two years' time, took a piece of, of completely destroyed farmland in Sussex and turned it into an ecological farm, certified. He's selling local food to local people with you know, happy cows and happy chickens. And I was just there last night, so I know for sure that this is real. And it happened in just two years, and he deserves to be singled out because it's an enormous accomplishment. And it shows to us that these things can happen and can happen very quickly and that individuals can make it happen. And finally, um, oh, by the way, here are some more people I wanted to just celebrate. This is just an example of the people I have the good fortune of meeting with and working with around the world. This is a group of Tibetan women. Uh, and one of them took our training course and then used this particular method that we have to then develop some new strategies for empowering the women in that part of, uh, of, of Tibet. You know, so individuals around the world can generate change and are generating change. It's happening right now. Finally, the number one reason why this will happen is that we don't really have a choice. This is our one planet. You know, we're not going anywhere. And that sense of inevitability for change will kick in the same way it's kicked in when we have faced other major calamities as a species or as peoples. You know, walking by the war, the war exhibits here in the, in the UK, I'm reminded that when faced with a serious threat like war, people really do change. Uh, they, they do change. This is a, a, a graph that's in the opening pages of my other book, the, the Sustainability Transformation. By the way, the title of that book's been changed um, because we wanted to just call it what it was. It's a book about change and it's a book about sustainability. So that's the name of the book, The Sustainability Transformation. And, and in that book, I just kind of sum up all this stuff in one graph. I say, look, this is the unsustainable stuff. It's been getting worse and worse because it's growing. This is, you know, this is fossil fuel use and pollution and the gap of the rich and the poor. But it will peak and drop. It will have to. It will either do it because we say we want that or it will happen because it's required. And this is the sustainable stuff. This is the stuff that's happening right now. This is the change in renewable energy, awareness, the, the Nagoya Agreement on Biodiversity, which dramatically increased the amount of the earth and the sea that we're willing to set aside for nature. Still far too low, but you know, we went from 1% of the sea to 10% of the sea in one global agreement, uh, and uh, from three, I think, to 17% of the global land surface for nature. That's an amazing accomplishment. We don't really pay attention to these things when they go well. We noticed Copenhagen because it didn't go well. We don't notice Nagoya because it was a kind of routine major breakthrough in international negotiations, yeah? Okay, so um, that's the message of the books. Uh, and uh, I wanted to just kind of close with a few inspirational messages that are not mine. These are the things that keep me going. Like, for example, Gregory Bateson, the major problems in the world are the result of the differences between the way nature works and the way people think. So, which is a way of kind of releasing us from the sense that people are somehow morally to blame. This is a mismatch in the way that we've evolved to, to, to desire and develop on planet Earth and the way that nature works. And we're having to learn that dance, which is what we're learning right now. <clears throat> Alfred North Whitehead did warn us that the major advances in civilization are processes that all but wreck the societies in which they occur. This is a kind of a Schumpeter notion that we should expect some pretty serious dislocation if and as we go through a successful transformation. Um, Francis Hodgson Burnett, at first people refused to believe that a strange new thing can be done. Then they begin to hope that it can be done. Then it is done. And all the world wonders why it wasn't done centuries ago. Yeah. And I invite you to think back on the things we actually have accomplished, and, and isn't this true? Yeah? 
Um, Norman Cousins, all things are possible once enough human beings realize that everything is at stake. And finally, my favorite, and this was, this was on my wall you know, 20, 30 years ago and, and still is in my mind, even if it doesn't have to be on my wall anymore. Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. That's the process of change. It's people gathering in groups to push new solutions out into the world. It's happening right now. It's happening at breakneck speed. It's happening just as fast as the spread of iPhones and the internet. Uh, it's, it's, it's part of the fabric of the reality that we live in, in China, in Europe, in the cities of North America, but not in the federal government level. But all around, you'll, you'll see this if you look for it, and it will, I hope, give you the same kind of hope and optimism that I have and that I still try to face the world with every day when I wake up in the morning. So I want to thank you for your attention, invite you to think outside the box, don't even think about thinking inside the box. <laughs> be, be bold, be creative, uh, and uh, think inside that thing instead of thinking inside boxes. Thank you very much. is of a place that actually is in the business of producing change agents, of producing exactly those small bunches of thoughtful and well-informed people who are hopefully going to go out and solve this problem. So we've got half an hour for you to up your, up your, up your capacity by taking advantage of having Alan here. Thank you. Questions? This is kind of a long one. OK, uh, I'll take notes. <laughs> so with all of this in mind, if you get people at the top to understand the whole system's perspective, there might be two things that they would do with that. <clears throat> the first, I would say, is a, a trend toward cooperation on the international level, which you see, for example, with the Arctic Council and commitments by Arctic powers to work together about resources in the Arctic. Uh, the second is the second option that they would have is to go through a resource scramble. Um, and so the same nations that are engaging with the Arctic Council are also bickering um, quite significantly. Uh, for example, the Canada shot, uh, shot over the bow of a US ship that was going through the Northwest Passage. And sure, and Russia planted a titanium flag on the yeah. bottom of the Arctic Sea. Right. Um, so and there, there are potentially more explosive situations than those. For example, uh, China's involvement in Sudan and Iran and India's uh, involvement also in Iran with oil. Mm. So how do you suggest that we make sure the world takes the first path, not the first path, not the second? Boy, that was a big question. Um, well, I mean, first let me say something really rather banal. And, and the really banal thing is that is to get involved rather than just observing. Yeah. So when it comes to international negotiations, uh, it turns out that, that that citizen engagement of various kinds actually does have an impact. Uh, when it comes to, however, the, the powers that be and resource scrambles, I'm not going to be a Pollyanna and suggest that it's all going to go really nicely. I think it's going to go in a really difficult, sort of bumpy way. Um, on, on the question of the Arctic, uh, there you've got a fairly delicate balance of things, but you've got a few actors that are, that are more enlightened than other actors, and, and the thing to do is support them and their efforts to be good facilitators of that process, for example. Um, uh, in, in cases like, you know, like, like Africa, then we have to turn to someone like Teddy, I think, who's, who's more of an expert in these matters, but, but, but that's, that's, a, that's a long conversation that has more to do with the, um, the interesting interplay between between, between China's, uh, China's need for resources, by the way, many of which are being used to create products for Western export, yeah, or export to other countries, uh, and um, the, uh, the, the challenging framework of expectation that the West and its development aid has, has given, has, has, uh, has laid on top of some of those developing countries. So it's not just about China. It, it ends up that, that Chinese investors are better at creating jobs for some of those people than Western aid donors. Uh, that, that's what the Africans think. So they're usually happy to 
invite the Chinese in to get the road built rather than talk about the environmental impact statement that has to be produced first before they'll get the money, for example. So these are not simple matters. They're matters that require kind of a fearless and searching inventory of how we do aid to begin with, uh, and then a fearless and searching inventory of how we negotiate with China about its role in these places. Now, um, thinking about change and transformation of sustainable development is not a replacement for very, very sophisticated international diplomacy. So uh, that's a game that will continue you know, forever uh, and for which there's no simple answer. But, but I will say that you know, engagement, for example, in Africa in ways that promote sustainable development of the kind that we're talking about, and particularly self-empowered sustainable development, are likely to help diffuse those tensions that might happen. I'll just pick up one example. Um, Mali um, uh, is, uh, was, has often been raised recently as a kind of a model of, of surprising success in a turnaround in its, in its, in its uh, approach to dealing with food production. And um, what's interesting about that is that it's not often talked about why they actually got much better at food production. And why they got better at it was that they stopped listening to the demands that they not, um, that they not subsidize their food market. Uh, you know, the West practices a lot of subsidy in agriculture and then tells Africa not to practice subsidy in agriculture. And Mali finally stopped doing this. This was very well reported in the New York Times, by the way. And as a result, had an explosion of, of food production. So there's some pretty fundamental development economics issues that are part of the politics of development that we really have to lift up and talk about, in addition to talking about you know, the, 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 um, the beautiful examples of green agriculture that we could also talk about. So you've asked me a long question. I gave you a long and nuanced and very undefinitive reply. But I hope it at least points you in a couple of interesting directions. Hi. Uh, thanks, Alan. Um, my question, if you walked onto the went onto the street out there and you asked a thousand people what they thought sustainability meant, you'd have a thousand different answers, pretty much. Well, you'd probably only have about a hundred answers that they even knew what the word meant, but go yeah, on. Yeah, it would be terrible if you're a researcher if you knew anything about sustainability. So we have an issue of literacy, and that, because we have a problem with literacy and in terms of sustainability, we also have a very poor narrative that nobody really communicates this properly. How do we identify or create a common language that is clear for people for them to make and, and decisions and undertake actions that actually move us towards so that common language can be spoken whether we're here in London or whether you're there in, in Stockholm or in Mali or wherever. So we've got that ability to actually clearly demonstrate how we are going to move forward. Sure. Do you think that's going to be possible and how should we try and get there? Well, I mean, again, it needs to be a sort of nuanced reply. So one, one thing that I think we, um, those of us who work on sustainability as a profession, which I've done for 22 years now, I, I can tell you that for many of those years I made the mistake of thinking that it was quite important that everybody understand the concept of sustainability. And, and one can end up having a kind of a missionary zeal <laughs> about these ideas. Systems thinking, sustainability, et cetera. We, everybody's got to understand it. Um, what I understood a little later was that that wasn't what was necessary. It's not necessary that 50% you know, that, that of the people on the street could answer that question credibly. What's important is that 50% of the people on that street do various things differently than they would otherwise do them. And some of those things they'll do because they really care. But some of them will do them because it's for their good health. Others will do them because it's what their friends are doing. Yeah. So there's a, there's a kind of, there's a, there's a, a series of gradations, segments, you will, in a population. And people make changes in their lives based on different reasons depending on which segment they fall into. What's weird is we know this really well when it comes to things like, you know, mobile telephones, you know, or, or audio equipment. And we, we understand the concept of audiophiles and, you know, the nerds who, who buy this stuff first and, and then the, 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 the factors that cause their friends to start and the advertising you need to reach the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the masses, so to speak. We don't apply that same basic principle of social diffusion and marketing to sustainability concerns. Yeah. So, not everybody needs to understand that word sustainability. Key decision makers do, and they should understand systems thinking and boundaries of the planet and all the rest of it, but not everybody does. In Sweden, I, I, it's easy for me to find the words that should be the things that we are lifting up more uh, that are in our culture. We have a word, logom, and that means having exactly the right amount of something. 
And it's a base concept in the culture. It doesn't mean enough, it means having the right amount of something. And if you have too much, you have more than enough, and more than you want, really. You know, it's like the, the amount of food on your plate. You don't want too much, you want the right amount that makes you exactly satisfied. That's a beautiful concept, and you don't have to understand sustainability to understand that concept. Yeah? So we need to find these kinds of things. You know, where, where do we get to the segment that is making core decisions about policies, programs, et cetera, that are, that are structuring our societies, change their minds, they need to understand sustainability. But then what about getting the entire advertising you know, apparatus to work thinking about what you're talking about? What are the core messages that will make everybody else happy? And a lot of it will be around health, happiness, quality of life, and not around sustainability. That's my view. The one thing we could add to that is that we do have the biggest capacity to to send out messages across the globe that's ever existed. I mean, it is possible to send messages. You know, when I worked in Uganda 15 years ago, basically you couldn't get a book. People in the north of Uganda were totally cut off. They now have computers and they can access the web and, and those messages can be got out to even the most remote people in the most remote places through mobile phones, computers and so on. So the possibility is there. The problem is getting the messages broadcast in the first place. Absolutely. I mean, you know, there are parts of the world now where it's possible to get an SMS on your cell phone telling you that your energy consumption is too high and, and that you're spending more money than you need to be spending. And so what I'm, one of the things I'm putting into the PowerPoints and reports <laughs> I'm working on in Egypt is, you know, Egypt is very high density of, it, the mobile telephone sector is very successful in that country. So why not leapfrog to that kind of technology with a five to 10 year time delay, but still, so that energy conservation, which is now completely absent, just jumps over several steps and gets to the point where you're getting instant feedback that, hey, you know, you're spending too much money on your power bill. Go home and turn off the lights. You know? And that has nothing to do with sustainability. It has to do with basic, you know, interaction with a, with a market. More, please, yeah. Questions? Uh, can you apply this optimism in field of economics, politics? The world forces, uh, faces so many political problems today. You see about Korea and other thing of Palestine. Whether this optimism can be applied in political sphere, the economics and other things. Oh, I would say it absolutely is applied. Now, again, I, I go back to my opening slides that it's not about a generally optimistic or a generally pessimistic attitude. It's about engagement. And it's about engagement in a way that is aiming to create the optimistic outcomes that we're talking about. Uh, it, um, it, you know, it, it's very rare that people go into an enterprise of any kind with a pessimistic view and succeed. <laughs> Uh, but, but what I can say is that the people that I, that I know, that I've met, who, who do engage in international diplomacy, are by nature optimists. And, and, and by that I mean that they go in really envisioning a positive outcome. Now they may think the odds of that outcome are low, so they're not unrealistic. Yeah? But they're, not, they're, not, they're not Pollyannas about the, the likelihood of, of what could be achieved. But they maintain a strong vision of what the desired outcome should be. In fact, the book I'm working on now is about exactly that issue, the issue of the human capacity to imagine preferred futures, preferred future conditions and outcomes, and then to steer uh, and, and try to manage the environments around us to achieve those conditions. That ends up being absolutely critical to the sustainability challenges that we're talking about. But in the realm of international diplomacy, where I have you know, very little experience, but I do have a few friends and acquaintances who work in that, in that area, that's a common quality that I see in them and that I see them bring to their work when they're negotiating in very, very difficult situations in the Horn of Africa or in Palestine, is the ability to hold within themselves an image, a description of that positive outcome, to communicate it effectively and even with the right timing, by the way, not to just sort of paint pictures of pie in the sky to the people they're interacting with, but to slowly introduce them to that vision and to try to create shared vision. There's a wonderful story about what happened in South Africa. Um, one, of the, one of the interventions that happened in the transition out of apartheid in South Africa involved a scenario planning exercise where people from all sides of that 
potential conflict, were brought together and said, okay, here are four possible outcomes for what could occur. And they ranged from civil war to what they have today. And once they saw that these were serious and possible outcomes, that decisions that they made could lead A, B, C, D to one of these several possible futures, they were more able to then gravitate to that positive outcome and to make difficult decisions that would then led them to that outcome. Yeah? It wasn't the only intervention that was critical. There was also the leadership of Mandela and many other factors. But that was, according to them, uh, participants in that process, a key piece of the success of the transition in South Africa was a shared common vision of a preferred outcome. So uh, that's, again, and I'll come back to my first point, that's not about just being optimistic. That's, that's about building the skill of, of, of holding a vision. And despite the odds, you know, remember, on, you know, Aung San Kyu Shin Shi, it's on the flimsiest of perceived foundations to still maintain your aim in that direction. Yeah. Hi, Destre. I'm, I'm actually a researcher at LEAD International, whose um, oh, curriculum yeah. uh, for uh, sustainable development leadership was partly designed by Dennis Meadows uh, 20 years ago. And um, I'm doing some research on their curriculum. I'm doing some research on their theory of change. Cool. And I was very interested in hearing your theory of change. Um, how do you actually believe that individuals can create change and how, how do you think it works? Excellent question. <laughs> you know, my theory of change is that you have to have a theory of change. <laughs> um, and, and I really mean that. One of the things that when we do training programs, we do, is we, tr we train people in developing a theory of change, which is related to this gentleman's question. It, it, it means having a sense of the logical, sometimes illogical, chain of events that might take you from here to there. And, and to have those assumptions made explicit so that you can test them, so that as you go from A to B, if it's not working the way you thought it was going to work, you can go back to and, and, and rethink your theory. Uh, so that's a way of saying that I don't think there's one theory of change for sustainable development. I think that there are different ways that change occur depending on the outcome you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to achieve a social behavior outcome, for example, then you probably need a mixture of uh, policy signals, economic price signals, campaigning and you know, communications. Uh, if you look at litter, for example, litter is an excellent case study for how change happens because it's one of the most studied social phenomena in this space around the world. Uh, and, and I once was asked to give a keynote speech at a national conference on litter in Australia. I said, I don't know a thing about Australia, about Australia or litter. But they said, well, we like your speeches. So I had to do a month of homework just to give a credible speech on litter, and I learned a lot. And one of the things was that in every place around the planet where this has been studied, it came down to three things. Good infrastructure, good policies, and repeated messaging. And if you took away one of those things, litter came back. Even if it had been gone for 10 years. If you took away the repeated messaging, litter came back again. And you had to start your process all over again. Yeah. So that's a theory of change for litter. But when it comes to transport, you know, the theory of change is a lot more about what infrastructure you have and, and what incentives you have for people to use it. So it's not about a specific theory of change, although I do, I do think that there are change agents and that change agents change systems. So I do have a kind of a core theory there uh, that I learned from Everett Rogers and others who studied diffusion of innovation starting back in the 1960s. But the, but the main thing is that I think Good theory, my theory of change is that we have to have good theories of change, and then if we test them and learn from them, then we are more effective than if we don't. I hope that's helpful. I have the lady at the back there. Uh, thank you for your presentation. My name is Cookie. Um, I have two questions and a comment. Um, my first question is, um, you talked about um, corporates uh, actually leading uh, governments and uh, politicians. And I'm just wondering, um, that's also what I see in the private sector as well working. And I was just wondering, why is that? Is it, is it the failure of citizens uh, in kind of motivating politicians to make the decisions? Or is there something um, taking place that's not very clear? That's a, that's a good question. I think it's a mixture. I mean, I've got a couple of case studies in my books that I like a lot. Um, I think there's somebody in the room that worked at Citigroup, if I recall. Uh, and there's a, there's a really interesting story about how, you know, why does Citigroup, for example, Citibank, ultimately sign the equator principles, which were, you know, the ethical standard around lending at that time. And the story is quite 
fascinating because it's the combination of a lot of activist pressure. And you may remember this, they were like running, the activist groups were running full page ads in the uh, International Herald Tribune um, calling the chairman of Citibank, um, you know, international public enemy number one for the Citibank's lending practices. And it's a, apparently a true story that the, his, uh, he was on vacation in Europe and his grandkids saw this picture of him. <laughs> and there's a story after story of activist pressure on Citibank. At the same time, that uh, a group of people uh, led by a friend of mine, Herman Mulder, uh, who was at ABN Onro Bank at the time, were framing the equator principles. So you had activist pressure plus an option that showed up which allowed for a, a transformative change to occur in that, in, well, that change anyway to occur in that company's practices. In addition to a lot of, you know, increasing awareness and scientific awareness and cultural awareness and sort of general social pressure. That's just one case study on one company. Um, so, we, so the short answer is there's usually a lot of factors in play. But a, a shorter answer that I'm seeing now more and more is that companies are recognizing that this is serious. They're looking at their own business models and their own dependency on particular resource flows. I work with a lot of people in the clothing sector, for example. And, you know, when floods hit Pakistan, floods that were very likely, even though no scientist can say this definitively, very likely caused by uh, climate change-related impacts. I mean, you had an enormously warm mass of air dumping water up into the Himalayas, just as you had an enormously warm Gulf of Mexico fueling that hurricane that hit uh, that hit New Orleans. These are heat impacts that you can certainly say are in line with what we expect with climate change. So when they see that occur, and they immediately see a change in the price of cotton, they know that their product is going to be more expensive and they won't sell as much of it in the stores. They'll have higher price points. Uh, not only that, but they may not be able to get as much cotton in the future. So they see genuine risks in pure business terms that they have to manage. Uh, in addition to the social pressures, in addition to the activist pressures, in addition to the fact that the web and the internet and TV cameras and little flip cams everywhere make anything that they do totally visible. Uh, it, this array of factors together, uh, combined with legislation, I mean in Indonesia there's a lot of change happening in Indonesia, why? Partly because there's this legislation on the book saying you must do CSR. And yes, you can say a lot of that CSR is really not so serious, but they're doing it. Uh, that's, that's what's happening. Yeah. Um, the, the bottom line for me is that I see companies having longer planning horizons and more of a fiduciary responsibility to assess risks and plan for those risks, and that this is driving internal change, whereas governments have four to five time year time horizons and are more risk averse when it comes to those kind of changes. So that's a short answer. That's a good question. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think it's hard for all of us to give up comforts that we have. And I'm not sure that, that that's the main message of sustainability is to, you know, give up the comforts that you have. It's to find new comforts that replace the ones that are not so great. Or to choose the comforts based on a different set of criteria. You know, so when it comes to clothes, for example, buy fewer of them, better quality that you like more. Um, there's a company in Sweden that I worked with, for example, that took a look at its business model, realized that it was based on overproducing, and then hopefully they would hit the mark with a certain percentage of their production, and the rest of it they would sell off really cheap or uh, ship off to uh, charities and all, all kinds of things, dump even. And they realized that there, it was a better business model for them to produce less, do better research on what consumers wanted, and get them to buy it at a higher price point, but less of it. Their revenues survived, and their entire, you know, their, their, their resource flows reduced. So it's, it's possible to do this. I'll, I'll end with an anecdote. I don't think this is any kind of an answer. But I, I ran into a young guy from Shanghai walking to a conference uh, recently, and, and I said, so, you know, Shanghai's changed a lot. <laughs> um, first time I was there was 82, and then I was back in the late 2000s, and it's changed a lot. What's it like for you? And he said, oh, there's too many choices. He says, I go to the store and, you know, there's like so many different kinds of shampoo and it's just too much. He says, it's really stressful. <laughs> this was a very well-dressed, internationalized, you know, Shanghai, you know, uh, MBA student. So, uh, so it's not impossible to imagine that, that, that in any culture we can rethink what the products we consume 
might mean to us in terms of our happiness and satisfaction. It's not completely out of the ballpark. Come over there. Hi, Alan. Thanks for your talk. Um, I was really interested when you said that the intelligence of a group could, relates to how much they talk to each other. Mm. And I wondered if you could expand on what you mean by talk to each other and what a good conversation is, because you gave a wonderful example at the beginning when you were on the bus and the lights went out and the windscreen wipers went out and then the driver turned around and he talked to you and he said, what should I do? But it doesn't sound like that conversation led to a very intelligent outcome. So no, could, you, could you give a, a more positive example of what you mean by a kind of intelligent group discussion? Sure. Um, well, you know, that, <clears throat> the, he just asked us what we wanted to do and a couple of loud voices started a chant that people you know, joined into. Probably less than half the bus was actually chanting. Jalan, Jalan. But that became, so that was actually a good example of what these researchers saw doesn't work. When you have one or two dominant voices basically taking all the airtime, as we call it. Um, what I mean, you know, if that bus driver had, had stopped, pulled us into a circle, set some ground rules for conversation, and had a facilitated, you know, process with a flip chart, you know, <laughs> I'm guessing we would not have kept going, you know. I'm guessing we would have found another solution. So, uh, the one reason why I liked that study so much is that, is that it confirms something that, that in, my, in my firm that we do, which is run an awful lot of workshops and processes where we either teach people or help people in a planning context to sit down in small groups with some good, clear ground rules, share information across disciplines or sectors or departments, whatever they're doing, uh, with some guidance on a good outcome for that conversation, produce a good outcome for that conversation. And we're not unique in this. Lots of practitioners are good at this. I can see a few of them in the room. And, and then to take that outcome and share with a group of groups and discuss that and you know, do, put it through a couple of filters, basically, then you get to some really good decisions. And you get to the decisions, if you do the process right, you get to them quickly. And more importantly, you get to a, a robust set of agreements. Uh, one process that we did with the uh, countries around the Baltic Sea, the, the, the results of that conversation had to go to the prime ministers for approval. But by spending enough time in small groups talking about the pros and cons, the system linkages, the leverage points, the, you know, what could go wrong, uh, they produced an agreement that survived every hurdle all the way to the prime ministers without even being tweaked, practically. It was tweaked only, they added something, but they didn't take anything away. And, but that was because of the quality of the discussion, the conversation. Discussion is actually not the great word. Discussion means bam, 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 and conversation means bring together. You know? So, so a, a good conversation uh, and it means, you know, I've, and I've, I see this over and over in my practice, the economists explaining to the environmentalists what they mean when they say discount rate, you know, which people think means the price reduction at the store. You know, so they don't get it. And we just assume we understand each other's, we don't understand each other's languages to begin with. So you start there. I could go on and on about this. I'm very passionate about it. Because I think that that is how we find solutions, is in good conversations. A couple more and then we should break. Yeah, last two. Hi. David Wynn from For the Future. Hi. Hello, David. Hi. So I have a question which sort of goes against the idea of systems thinking. And so I don't necessarily agree with it, but I, I think it's something we need to talk about. Okay. Which is whether we need to prioritize climate change over everything else. Um, we have, according to latest science, a very short amount of time to do an enormous amount on climate change, um, particularly on changing our energy systems. And I fear that governments and others only have so much headspace. And so to ask them to do lots of stuff on sustainability may be a way of making sure we do, we do not enough on anything. And maybe what we should do for the next decade is really knuckle down on climate change and perhaps address climate change in a way that starts to solve other problems. So it's not a, it's not a techno fix, but we really think, look, at, look at all problems in terms of climate change because unless we make progress on that, it doesn't matter what we do on anything else. Mm -hmm. So. Do you think that is a good idea? Well, you know, sim similar arguments were raised um, in the 70s and 80s around nuclear weapons. That, that, that really nuclear weapons were the thing we should only be looking at because if, you, if that gets out of hand, everything goes, you know, the way it goes with a nuclear holocaust. Yeah. And, and my answer to that would be, well, we didn't just focus on nuclear weapons. We focused on a whole lot of other development challenges, and it worked out fine. <laughs> On climate change, it's a more difficult and subtle point, and it's, it's, it's not one that I have a ready answer for. 
Um, I, I do know how people work, and I know that if you, st if you stand up and say we should only do climate change, no matter how right you may be, even if you could be Cassandra-like in your prophetic abilities, or you could be like one of those satellites watching Bill McKibben's you know, army of 350 activists making art, and you could see that, yes, climate change is the thing they really ought to be working on. There would be so many people who would say you were, you know, you were wrong and were, who would be really mad at you and really ticked off for saying that, that you would create a great hubbub and nothing would happen. So I think it's actually more constructive to say that a lot of us and much of our activity really must be focused on energy and climate change, on energy really, and energy access, on energy systems, the quality of energy, the transformation in the energy sector. Uh, but guess what, you know, water, <laughs> Guess what development, guess what the international diplomacy we were talking about earlier, any of these other things could pitch us over into tripwires and create nonlinear events in the global system that could then undermine our ability to make the advances we're trying to make on climate. So uh, a systems argument argues against that argument, if you will, but more to the point, human psychology argues against it. We just, we're just not that kind of a people as a race um, of, of you know, as, uh, we like diversity, and we all want to do our thing. Um, so I would say no. <laughs> that would be my answer. Um, if you decide to start the let's all focus on climate change initiative, I'm likely to join, um, because that's where my, my, my own passion is around energy, water, and climate change. But I know the people who are passionate about diversity, and boy, I, I want to give them full reign to go save the species that I love so much. So, Good question. Last, last question from over there. Hi, Len. Uh, thanks for the lecture. Um, just had a question around the sense of urgency around certain environmental issues, sure. like climate change and water scarcity. Um, now, if we look at the issue of climate change, there's certain parts of the world that are going to be affected far more badly than others. In fact, some areas might even gain from climate change by becoming warmer. Now, what, what message would you give to poor farmers in Africa that are suffering from drought and people in Asia that are in the midst of floods right now, um, where they cannot really create or become those change agents themselves? So for example, I mean, a lot of the issues around climate change are around adaptation finance from the West through to the developing world. And a lot of these people will need that adaptation finance in order to make sure that they're prepared for the future. So how would you tell them to be optimistic in the face of such challenges? Well, I, I wouldn't. You know, I wouldn't go to them and say, be optimistic. I would go to the, and I do, I mean, I work in that space to some degree. And, and what I do is I go to the, any, any person of influence that I have access with and try to advance the, the general agenda of providing them with the resources they need to make that, to, to make that adaptation. Uh, one of the reasons why I've, I've found it satisfying to do some work uh, in, in Africa, in the Nile Basin, and in Egypt, is because those, that part of the world is incredibly at risk. And the urgency is underlined you know, to me as a visiting outside international expert uh, every time I go, because the, 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 not only is the data compelling, uh, in Egypt, for example, it's, it's, uh, they're, they're, um, they're already in technical, technically defined water stress, uh, they will reach water deficit by 2017. They will probably reach technical defined drought conditions as a, as a constant condition by 2020 to 2025. Again, unless action is taken. So rather than go to a farmer in Egypt and say, be optimistic, what I, would, what I do is work with my colleagues in Egypt who are working with the Ministry of Agriculture and other aid providers and saying, okay, how can we help shift this system so that farmer is supported in making the changes that she or he will have to make in order to survive uh, in a, in a you know, dramatically altered world. So that's what optimism means to me in that context. Again, it means, going back to this gentleman's question, having a clear vision of what the desired outcome is, and then in whatever role you've decided to take on in that change process, working at those points of change with as much focus and and care as you can while holding that vision, you know, no matter, no matter what, basically. And then if something happens and that vision becomes impossible because the catastrophes occurred, well, then it's the vision of recovery from the catastrophe, you know. Um, it's uh, Garrett, Garrett Hardin, who wrote the classic, and this is probably a good thing to end on, uh, wrote the classic essay, The Tragedy of the Comets. Uh, and, and he was an interesting thinker, Hardin. He said, you know, uh, humans are interesting. 
uh, because the pessimistic ones have been bred out of the population. I mean, if, you, if, if, the, if the Mongol hordes have just destroyed your village and you, know, you decide that this is a really depressing situation and you go throw yourself in the river, your genes do not continue. But if you wake up the next morning after the Mongol army has passed on, and like you know, Scarlett O'Hara, you say, tomorrow is another day, and you begin rebuilding your hut and have kids, you go on, and your genes go on. And so we have a natural tendency to want to go on. Uh, this is, is something in the human condition that people either celebrate or decry, because it can also give us a kind of a Pollyanna, you know, not, not face the truth equality. Uh, but I, I, I agree with Hardin on that, and I think that you know, what that means is that, it, that the work of people who are seriously and professionally interested in promoting the outcomes we call sustainable development is to, is to keep thinking about what tomorrow means and to try to generate the tomorrow that we hope for uh, and, and never give up in, in terms of imagining that it's possible. Uh, because once we stop believing that it's possible, it stops being possible. Thank so you I very much. Thank you I think we'll attention. have to stop there. If I could just say that I think we've had a remarkable sort of statement of one of my big propositions, which is pessimism of the mind, optimism of the will. We basically have got to understand the challenges that confront us, and if we don't take them seriously, we're going to get nowhere. But if we allow that to destroy our capacity to act, we are certainly going to end up uh, in the worst possible place. Thank you very much for a very good <laughs>